What's this, an olive oil tasting? In a manner of speaking, we're talking my language now, Mr. Wells, where you may know a little bit about wine, you may leave the judging of the olive oil to me. Really? Yes, really. Hmm. Greece. Spain. France. California. Portugal. Go with the Greek. It's sweeter, like I me. I don't believe it. You cheated. Oh, Stephen, when are you going to learn that I am much more than just a pretty face? Yum, yum, yum. Yum, yum, yum. Yum, yum. Yum, yum. Yum, yum. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of One Chef, One Critic. I'm Carl Wells, food critic for The Telegram. And I'm Chef Steve Watson of Central Dairy. Well, Steve, choosing an oil these days is becoming almost as complicated as choosing a wine. Absolutely, Carl. As you know, in Europe, with your wines, you get regional flavours. You also get regional flavours with your olive oils as well. Although the, we are getting olive oils out of the California coast as well. Normally, we're dealing with three different flavours. We're dealing with an extra virgin olive oil, which you would normally use in your salads. And then you'd use a light olive oil, preferably for, uh, for cooking with, and that's got a higher flash point. But we're also getting now infused olive oils as well, like here, we've got some rosemary here, we've got some parsley, and we've got uh, some basil. Now, these are readily available in the stores, and you can drizzle them over your foods and over your salads so as well. So they're infusing the oils just like they do vinegar. Exactly. That's a great yeah, idea. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks, Steve. Coming up on the program today, we have Liam McKenna. He's the brewmaster at Yellow Belly Brewery and Public House, and he's going to tell us all about the world of brewing beer. And what are we going to cook for him? We're going to be making a beautiful lamb chamvalon uh, mm. with a secret ingredient. That sounds very interesting. And Brenda O'Reilly is our guest chef today. Brenda, of course, is the co-owner and executive chef at Yellow Belly. And she's going to be doing a Waldorf salad. So stay tuned. For a complete listing of One Chef, One Critic recipes, wine lists, and more, check out our website. Let us know what you think of the show at 757-9600 or send us an email at onechef.onecritic at rci.rogers. Uh, for someone who loves beer, uh, I'm really happy to have an actual beer maker on the program today. Liam McKenna of Yellow Belly Brewery. Thanks for coming on the program, Liam. My great pleasure. Great to have you with us. Now, uh, as, a, as an artist who makes beer, uh, I'm thinking you probably like to cook as well. Love to cook. Oh, well, see, we've got. We, I'm really happy now that we've got you on the show. <laughs> we've got a very special dish for you today, Liam. We're going to be making lamb chambalin. So we've got some beautiful lamb chops here some shoulder chops. We'll just season them a little bit with salt and pepper. And uh, then I'll get you to put a little bit of oil in the pan and we'll get them seared off. And Carl, for you, I've got a little job for you. We've got some beans and some red peppers there. And I want you to wrap them in bacon. We're gonna be doing those, so. Okay, that's So we we'll just put them in. Yep, Liam, there you go. Sure. Start putting them in, perfect. And what we're going to be doing, adding to that dish, we're gonna be cooking them with some sliced onions and potatoes and then some beef stock and some thyme and a little bit of your favorite some wexford oh, wheat wexford wheat there you go you <laughs> see just for you so liam uh, why did you become a a brewmaster a beer maker carl i started out as uh, wanting to become a winemaker oh <laughs> and uh, i spent some time apprenticing as a winemaker in niagara in ontario and thereby discovered that the real skill in making great wine is growing the grapes and I had no interest in becoming a farmer. Ah. So I kind of fell into brewing. I had always been a home brewer. Uh, kind of fell into brewing, but once I did, and once I started making beer professionally, I never looked back. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's something that I have a great passion for. And uh, I have, I think I have a lot of, of wisdom to offer a lot of the young brewers that are starting sure. in this world today. Yeah. I know I don't look very old, Carl, but I've been at this for 25 years. Wow. 25 years, my yeah. goodness. Wow. Yeah, that is. So how how did you actually uh, become as skilled as you are in making beer? Because you are one of the finest brewmasters in the country. Oh, I'll, thank I'll, you, Carl. I'm <laughs> saying that. But uh, and I've drunk uh, a lot of your beer. Uh, so uh, how did how do you how do you how did you become so uh, so good at it? And did you go to school to learn how to become a brewmaster? I went to school and I studied applied microbiology at the University of Guelph in Ontario. Uh, and as I, I mentioned, I wanted to be a winemaker. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it wasn't until after I finished that degree 
when I was having a crisis of faith about becoming a winemaker that uh, a friend of mine, one of the first brewers in Canada in the microbrewing end of things, uh, suggested I go and talk to a startup company. They were looking for a brewer. Mm. I kind of resisted them at first, but he convinced me to go and talk to them, and they hired me on the spot. Wow. And, you know, and since then, it has, you know, brewing unlike winemaking, where sometimes you have to wait for years to see the, the fruits of your labor, if you will. Brewing is very like brewing is very rapid. You know, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, for us it's a two week process. Mm -hmm. So it allows you people like me to hone their skills uh, in a continuous way. I'm always learning. There is never a day that goes by in a brewery, even after being at it for so long, mm. that I I don't learn something new. So, do you need help when you're making the uh, beer? Do you have an apprentice or I have I have. Currently, I have two assistants helping uh -huh. me, and I have a third assistant arriving in the summer uh, who has just completed a course at, uh, in Ni Niagara College in Ontario. They have yeah. a brewmaster's course that is a sister course to their winemaking course there. Uh, so I'm very, very much looking forward <laughs> to having, <laughs> an, assistant having an assistant there that, that, that is not relying strictly upon me sure. for their basis of knowledge about the beer. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and it allow me to step back a little bit and maybe even take a weekend off or two. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that would be, that <laughs> would be a dream. Which is always a nice thing. Uh, so now a lot of people who aren't beer aficionados yes. um, don't really know much about the, <clears throat> the differences between say lager and ale. Can you just quickly explain the difference between a lager, which I think is probably very popular in this province, and an ale? Yeah, uh, now it's all very confusing, actually. I mean, uh, the large breweries tend to, tend to refer to all of their beers as lagers. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are referred to as ales, but I know for a fact they're made with lager yeast. They're actually lagers. Mm -hmm. uh, an ale, to me, an ale is like a cousin that shows up to a wedding who won't sit down and shut up. <laughs> Right, and very loud and effusive. A lager is like, you know, a quiet old auntie that sits in the corner and oh, sips tea. Right. So brewers tend to think of lagers as an ale that's missing half mm -hmm. of its character. Mm -hmm. ales, okay. ales tend to be fresh and fruity. Ales are meant to be a very rapid process, consumed when they're young. Lagers, traditionally, lagers is a six to nine week process. Oh, it okay. takes a lot longer, the yeast are much slower, and the yeast contribute, in my estimation, a lot less flavor to the beer. They don't right. have that kind of fruity element to them that So how long do. have you been in the province now? I've been here for five years. Five years? Yeah. Always at Yellow Valley? Always at Yellow Valley, yeah. yeah. And uh, you started the, brewer, the brewing technique there right from day one, I guess. Right from day one. Right. I designed the recipes and trained the people, I designed the systems, helped, with to put the lamp help, helped the architects. Um, you know, with uh, all the questions that they have, I mean, let's face it, there are, there are very few breweries <laughs> in Newfoundland, and, and on a small scale, um, there's a lot of consideration that needs to go into design and layout and pipe structures and uh, electrical and plumbing and whatnot. So, a good portion of my first year here was doing just that. I'm just freaking a little bit of time on there. Ooh, lovely. D now, do you have a passion for cooking yourself? Or? I do. I do. Uh, uh, my wife is a fantastic cook as well, um, but I have always, in my household when I was growing up, my father was the cook. Mm. My mother, God bless her, and I hope she, <laughs> she doesn't see this, my mother could burn water, right? It's just like... Uh, <laughs> Remove this from the, from the stove there. Yeah. So, so I, I grew up in a house where it was completely normal for, for young men to learn how to cook, sure, to yeah. learn about food. Yeah. Uh, and it has served me very well, and I do, I have a great passion for cooking. I love more than, more than cooking, I don't really like to cook for myself, but I love to cook for other people. Yes, that's right, that's what the, 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 I that's the, the real feeling. enjoyment. I know yes. the feeling. Yes, thank you very much, Steve. <laughs> hey, look what I've done here. This oh, is, I, they look beautiful, cups. do. So what's the difference, essentially, between a, a mass-produced beer and your kind of beer? Because, I mean, you're really an artist, an artisan, aren't you? Yeah. There are, you know, Health Canada allows, uh, I think it's 109 different ingredients in beer now. And 109? Yeah, and, and on the small scale it tends to be, it tends to be about your raw materials, your malt, water, hops, and yeast. Uh, on a very large scale, uh, it tends to be much more about technology. 
I like to keep things simple. There's a whole group of, of things that large brewers might or might not use in their product that I refer to. I, <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> I refer to as snot. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm really I'm cooking here, and it's probably the wrong term, right? But it's just I refuse to I refuse to use, you know, yeah. I refuse to use things in the process that don't need to be there. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and time is your friend, and and taking the time to do it well, and and taking the time to allow the yeast and the the ingredients to, to give you yeah. what you need, yeah. as opposed to trying to push it through the system by our through artificial means with with technology, with bacterial source enzymes to artificially age the beer, with high gravity brewing, so you're adding lots of water just before it goes yeah. to the package. Yeah. Uh, I understand why large brewers do this, but but. Let's face it, the, 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 reasons, the, the primary reason why microbrewing is, is popular in North America right now is because of the mediocrity of large brewers. Right. And, yeah. and small brewers like myself tend to refer to these large mainstream beers as wet air. Right. The beer designed for people who really don't like beer. No. Now, no. I recognize that is 95% of the market, but it's not my market. Right. Yeah. Okay, Liam. Well, you make some good points. Just re recap what you did there now, Steve. Okay, well, what I did there, Liam, um, we've sliced some potatoes on there. I've just put the Wexford ale in there and some beef stock. We'll just season that now. That is now ready to go into the oven for about two and a half hours at a very low heat, maybe 275, 300 degrees. But because of the wonders of television, if you'd just like to mm -hmm. step to one side there. While you're, while you're doing that, I'm going to go to the wine cellar and see if I can come up with some wine to go with this or possibly some beer. Sounds <laughs> good to me. <laughs> it better not be the mass-produced wine. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. So there we see, Liam, our beautiful that Lamb Chambalon. It's nicely browned on the top and the aroma there beautiful. is just absolutely mm. amazing. I think with those vegetables that you've got there, beautiful. it's just going to, be, going to be beautiful. There we go. Well, Tracy, I like the look of the labels. <laughs> They're very interesting. But hey? uh, tell me, how, how well will these go with our lamb chamvelin? Well, um, I picked some really robust, heavier bodied wines to go with the lamb, because lamb has got really nice, interesting flavors. Yeah, strong flavors, yeah. high flavor. Yeah. yeah, so I from three different countries, we have the Peter Lehman Layers Red from <laughs> Barossa Valley in Australia. Now, I've never never met a Barossa Valley wine that I didn't like. Ooh, well, this is interesting. This has Shiraz, yeah. Tempranillo, mm -hmm. Mouvedre, and Grenache in it. Oh. Really interesting grapes for Australia. Wow, so, that is and interesting. And it's a beautiful wine. This retails yeah. for nineteen ninety nine. Then we so. have from South Africa. And South Africa, I find, are really well known for their earthy style wines. And lamb can be a little bit earthy tasting. And this is the Graham Beck, the Game uh, Keepers Reserve Cabernet Sauvignon. And this retails for twenty two sixty eight. And this is a big, full-bodied wine. Yeah. Very okay. heavy. Yeah. And the last wine we have is the Trius Red from the Niagara region in Canada. And this is VQA. And VQA means that all the grapes have to be grown, it has to be bottled, it has to be harvested in Canada. So all the grapes, everything in this bottle is Canadian. Vintner's and Quality Assurance. Absolutely. VQA. And this is a blend as well. It's a Bordeaux blend. It's Cabernet, Merlot, and Cab Franc. Mm. I've had their uh, Champagne-style wine. Very but, nice. Uh, the tree is I've, never had, yeah. I've never had this one before. Okay. Decisions, decisions. Well, you know what? Um, I, I, I love those Barossa Valley wines. <laughs> Want to give it a try? So I think I'm going to give this one a try, the Peter Lehman. Great. Um, and all of those different uh, uh, grape varietals uh, interest me greatly. Yeah. So thank you very much. I will check this out. Excellent. Enjoy. Thanks. Now I'll just put our bacon wrapped vegetables on the plate there on our beautiful lamb chamvalon. So let's go and see what Liam and Carl think to our dish. Liam, we've got a nice little number here from Australia to go with our lamb chamvalon. Thought it would be a, a you know, a nice change for you to have one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Uh, so um, have a taste of this I lamb and, and tell us what you think. Hmm. I think whoever did those vegetables did a fabulous Oh, job. they did. It really brings color to the plate, doesn't it, Carl? <laughs> Yeah. 
Oh, absolutely delicious. Mm. Absolutely delicious. Mm. The meat is so tender. It just falls off the bone, the, isn't uh, it? Lovely. The taste of the lamb has really sort of gone through, through the, the, uh, potatoes uh, the potato, mm -hmm. eh? <laughs> I definitely get the Wexford wheat in there, too. It's <laughs> yeah. lovely. Yep. So, uh, Liam, where, where can people buy uh, Yellow Belly beer? Is, or is it just at the, um, the brewery itself? Uh, you can buy it at the brewery itself. You can also buy the bottles, um, 750 mil bottles, at the NLC, at the liquor store. Mm -hmm. um, you can find draft beer at O'Reilly's. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find our draft also at the airport bar, Compass <coughs> owns. All right, okay. Yeah. And uh, finally at Bitter's Pub, the Grad Student Lounge. Mm -hmm. Oh, excellent. University. Oh, yeah. on the university then? Good. Yes, and the you know, university are, are, are great customers of ours. <laughs> 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 and you thank them implicitly, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Do you do much traveling uh, for for your work? Uh, do you travel to countries that are known for their beer making? Or I, travel, personal travel for me always involves beer. Oh, always. Uh, you know, if I'm visiting somewhere I've never visited before, I will seek out the local brewery. It would be top of my agenda, <laughs> dragging the family along, of course. <laughs> but. Um, Travel for work, uh, I don't really do a lot of traveling for work right now, but I have in the past. And again, it's always about lo mm -hmm. the finding the local breweries. Yeah, you could say that kind of beer directs my life in so <laughs> many ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, there are no, you know, like brewmaster conventions or anything there like are, that? There are. There are. The uh, the Craft Brewers Association had their, their recent convention uh, in San Diego. It's held mm -hmm. every two years. And uh, this one that just finished, they had over 3,000 attendees there. Right? Wow. From all over the world? From all over the world, primarily yeah. the U.S. Uh, you know, when I started in this industry back 25 years ago, uh, I think there was about 75 breweries in the United States, and we've just crossed over in the U.S. alone the 1,500 brewery mark. Really? So there has been a huge resurgence of, of brewing. And the small brewers are the only really growing segment of the brewing industry. Mm -hmm. The large brewers well, are shrinking. They're condensing and shrinking. Yeah. Yeah. They're condensing and shrinking. And you know we are the main employer in the brewing industry now, by far, the small brewers, mm -hmm. right? And large brewers have largely adopted technology to replace people. Um, is it true that Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are the per capita, the, the largest group of beer drinkers in, in the country, or? I think the Yukon is slightly more. Oh, okay. I could be wrong there. It kind of vacillates back and forth. Um, yes, Newfoundlanders do drink a lot of beer uh, statistically, right? But I think the reality is something a little bit different. Uh, you know, the population of Newfoundland is quite small. Uh, but in the summertime, it swells yeah. greatly. Yes. So, and and for those three or four months where the population is swollen greatly, I would venture to guess that many people visiting Newfoundland indulge in a few <laughs> beers and and perhaps even a few more beers than native <laughs> Newfoundlanders. That's, that's a peak time do. for your brewing season. It's then. a peak time for yeah. all breweries in this yeah. province, mm -hmm. right? And for most businesses in this province, yeah. uh, uh, whether you're making beer or toothbrushes, it's it's uh, it's it's. Prime time. You make hay when the sun shines. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Where do where do most of your ingredients come from? Uh, most of my ingredients, uh, well, uh, varied sources. Uh, I I purchase malts from a few different places, from uh, Scotland, uh, from Thomas Fawcett and Son in England. Uh, a lot of Canadian malt as well. About fifty percent of the malt I use, malted wheat and malted barley, is is Canadian hops. There are no kind of commercial growers of hops in Canada anymore. Um, hops come from Germany, England, and the United States. Well, thank you for being on the show today, Liam. It's been Cheers. fascinating speaking with you. Yeah. And uh, coming back, we're going to stick with Yellow Belly. Actually, we've got Brenda O'Reilly, co-owner and executive chef there. She's going to do a Waldorf salad. Next guest certainly knows her way around a kitchen, but she's much more than uh, a good cook. She's a restaurateur, a pub owner, manager, and a pretty savvy businesswoman. <laughs> uh, Yellow Belly is one of the most popular restaurants in the city of St. John's. Uh, it also, in addition have it to having a restaurant, gastro pub, it has a microbrewery, and of course, O'Reilly's is full on non stop. It's an entertainment emporium. Uh, in the downtown of our city and because I've just said her surname you probably have already guessed that our guest is none other than Brenda O'Reilly.
Hello, how are you? Great, how are you? Thank you. Oh, thanks for having me. You look great, great as news. always. It's, it's, as usual, it's great to have you back on the show again. And what are you going to be preparing for? Is I see a little bit of salad, a little bit of Waldorf? Yes, I am. I'm doing an inspired Waldorf salad. And we have the underbelly open at Yellow Belly right now. Mm -hmm. So it's sort the of... The underbelly? It's, <laughs> yes, <laughs> the underbelly. What is the underbelly? It is a speakeasy. So, oh, very good. Well, we, we thought... This is where all the undesirables <laughs> hang out. The people you don't want up on the higher level, just, just sort of put, put them downstairs. No, no, Carl, all the cool people hang out. <laughs> all the cool people hang out in the underbelly. It's a yeah. very cool room, as you know. It's okay. the oldest part of the building, yeah. and it we were we were redefining it as a bar, and uh, as we were doing so, Craig goes, this would be a wicked speakeasy. Yes. And so it is, and so yeah. it is, and so now our menu is inspired by the speakeasy era from 20s right, to the 30s. What should be, what, the 30s? 20s, 30s. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so what we're doing is uh, we've got some menu items that are inspired by that time frame. And Waldorf salad, of course, was uh, developed at the Waldorf you know, uh, Astoria in the 20s, in the yeah. late 20s. And so what we've done is we've we've done an inspired Waldorf salad. Yeah, that's great. So yeah. typically it would be just a bed of lettuce. So we're using some iceberg, shredded iceberg lettuce yeah. as part of the salad. And what I've done is I've shredded the ingredients. And of course, the main ingredients in a Waldorf salad is apple, celery, um, red grapes and normally walnuts, but uh, Craig is allergic to walnuts, so I'm using oh, pecans. Yeah. Um, so what I've done is, and it was usually diced and, and all tossed together. In leave it to Craig, which is uh, Brenda's spouse, by the way. Leave it to him to be allergic to uh, a strange nut. Most people <laughs> are allergic to peanuts. He has to be allergic to walnuts. And many other nuts, to be honest, but not peanuts. <laughs> And he's also allergic to fish. He's very hard to cook for. Oh, my God. <laughs> so okay. I had to be inspired because I have to do other That's things right. than the normal. Makes you creative, yeah. It does. But so what we've done is we've taken these main ingredients, but we've added some dry cherries. So, uh, of course, the main ingredient is apple. And I have four different uh, apples in here. But you can just use the one apple. No, oh, but that's a nice idea doing. Uh, yeah, so I just got for color flavors, and yeah. texture and flavor and all that. So the main ingredient is apple in a Waldorf salad, and of course we have celery, which is the other main ingredient. Equal portions of celery and mm -hmm. apple typically go in a Waldorf, and then we've got the um, the the uh, dry cherries, which I've added as a little bit of a, a savory taste to it, and the traditional red grapes. Now the pe the pecans we're leaving for last as right. more of a garnish. So typically they would toss uh, just a mayonnaise into this salad. Mm -hmm. And what I've done here is because we like to cook with beer at Yellow Belly. Mm -hmm. um, we incorporated the beer into the mayonnaise. The beer is in oh, the mayonnaise. So we've got you a mayonnaise. didn't. <laughs> really? <laughs> we didn't. Okay. We, we cook a lot with beer at, at yeah. Yellow Belly. So we have some Fighting Irish Red Ale in this mayonnaise. Mm -hmm. And of course, citrus. We've got uh, lemon, uh, lime, and orange in here, as well as a touch of balsamic vinegar pinch of salt and pepper. Perfect. So it's about a quarter of, I'm not going to measure, we don't need to measure. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, so, I can say that this is going to be the first time I've ever tasted mayonnaise with beer incorporated. <laughs> oh, is that right? Wow. Yeah, well, right. we have a couple of our salad dressings down there with, with beer in oh, them as good. well, yeah. Good. Um, as well, this is really nice with, I've been testing this recipe quite, quite a bit over the last while, and uh, it's really nice as well with some cold with some cold chicken on top. I bet. Or, mm -hmm. or yeah. Yes, or yeah. any, any yeah. cold protein, but what a really nice, refreshing salad. So it's a simple little salad. And I did the uh, carrot, the um, apples ahead of time. And what I did was I, um, I put them in uh, a, a, a uh, ginger ale. Mm. To keep the um, to keep them from going brown, and the uh, apples then take on some of that little little fizz. That's right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I should do sorry. Steve one too as well. Smoothie. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll we'll give you a fork there anyway. We we'll let him have some occasionally. Yeah, occasionally. <laughs> yes. So it is a really refreshing salad, and it does bring back those times. And, mm -hmm. and um, there you go. Well, it brings. Well, Carl, Carl would remember the 1920s <laughs> anyway. You know. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. All of a story. Mm. <laughs> Very tasty. That is really good. Yeah, so it's a little twist on an old favorite. Mm. And the, uh, the way you've cut the apple and so forth gives it a nice, interesting texture. It does. Really I wanted that sort of shredded. I wanted to go with the lettuce, the way the lettuce is shredded, so mm -hmm. I wanted to have that sort of follow through. Mm -hmm. So it's different. Usually it's usually chunk. You can do it any way you want. Thank you for being on the show, Brenda. Thank you very much. Of Yellow Belly, Underbelly, and O'Reilly. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it for this edition of One Chef, One Critic. No idea. Yeah, look at that. I, yeah, it's like, uh, well, I guess that's what you call um, julienne. Right. Mm. And I like what Craig's choice of the pecans. <laughs> What's this, an olive oil tasting? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. It is. Yeah. It does smell good.